Hi everyone, my name is Shreya and together with my alumni committee team members Sharmila, Sabir and Ananya, it is my pleasure to welcome you to BIS Talks 2021. When I think of BIS, I think of a school that celebrates individuality. We were encouraged to participate in whatever way we chose and our contribution was always appreciated. This culture makes BIS students and alumni brave brave enough to wholeheartedly put effort behind our passions. Our speakers today embody this BIS spirit, and I'm very excited for them to share their inspiring stories. Before we move on to the main event, I also want to highlight to our alumni speakers that on the coming Tuesday, 21st December, there is a BIS alumni reunion at Flamboyant from 7 p.m. onwards. Please buy your passes if you haven't already. It's sure to be a great evening you will have received an email with full details. Finally, onto the format of today's event. We have five alum and three student speakers today. We, were, we wish we were doing this together in Gilbert Hall, but unfortunately we couldn't. So we'll try to make the session as interactive as possible. Please share any questions you have for the speakers in the chat window on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, on the right-hand bottom of your screen. At the end of the talks, we will host a speaker panel where each speaker will answer a few questions from the chat. After that, each alum speaker will move into an individual breakout room where you can join them to continue the conversation. So now let's officially get started. You may have seen our first speaker in movies like The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel or Luck by Chance, or even in TV shows like Sense8 or Spotlight here to encourage us to get involved in the arts from the BIS class of 1995, actor Sid Makkar. Savir, uh, you can cue Sid's video. Sid Mokar, I'm 5 feet 11 inches tall, and uh, these are my profiles. So as of now, I am available on the shoot dates, and I really look forward to it. Thank you. These lines that I just said, I have said like a gazillion times. These are lines that one says as an introduction video, when you're auditioning for a film, a TV commercial, a web series, whatever. And... Um, well, hello, I am Sid Makkar and I am a professional actor. I'm a former student from Bombay International School. Uh, I was a very shy kid at school. I was the perpetual daydreamer. Uh, every report card of mine said this kid has potential, but the problem is he's constantly looking out of the window, uh, daydreaming. Frankly, I think at the time all I cared about was getting back home and playing cricket or football with the kids in the building. Uh, the irony is, even though I'm a professional actor now, all of school, I didn't take part in a single play. I don't think I ever stood on that stage reading a poem. Uh, I played the guitar to some extent, but I think mostly I struggled with it. I sounded terrible as a singer, and um, I think I took part in one single debate. That too because I was Vita House captain, and it seemed I needed to do more than just represent the house, you know, in sport activities in the March past. Basically, I see myself as a late bloomer. So after school, all my friends went to America to study. So I figured I need to go as well. Uh, but hey, what do I do? Because I didn't know what to do. At the time, there was this tech revolution happening. So I figured, okay, computer science and economics. While I was in America, I took up an acting class and I fell in love. It was love at first sight. It is like your first love. I found something that I thought was my calling. I felt within me senses that I had never felt before. That's how I felt about it. The problem was, I'm a thousand miles away in a foreign land studying a different degree, spending a lot of money despite having a, a tuition waiver and I just happened to have found my calling, you know. I felt like, damn, I think, I think I have a problem. So 
So what do we do now? Do I take this up as a career? Do I not? You know, what if, what if things don't work out for me? What if people laugh at me? What, what will my parents say? What, my dad is a heart patient. Will it affect his health? I had all these questions going on within me and it was, it was a strange time because um, for the first time in my life, I was so certain about what I want to do. Anyway, so what I did was I locked myself in a room and didn't speak to anybody that weekend. And I remember writing down pros and cons of taking up acting as a profession. Very seriously thinking about this. Three months later, I was back in Bombay pursuing um, being an actor. I enrolled into an acting school and thereafter I started the work. I became a 5 am -er. I spoke only in Hindi because I felt my Hindi was good but it could only be better. I started meeting people, I started auditioning, I was going to every single office with photographs. Uh, this was before um, the smartphone era, so we did that. And uh, hey, you know what? I didn't care about what people said. I was so motivated and I didn't care if a distant relative made fun of me. It didn't matter. I finally found for the first time in my life what I want to do. And I just gave it my all. I was, the focus was beautiful. And there was this inner strength from within. There was this, this calling from within. That's just how I, be, how I can best describe it because there's no logic to a lot of these things, right? Anyway, so within six months, I land a part in a pretty big film and I was, I was excited because it just made sense. It's like, you know what, I had a vision and the world is helping me. It's all sort of falling into place, except the film came out, it crashed, it bombed, it got the worst reviews and till today, it happens to be um, probably the worst project I've ever been a part of. Um, I reached this really low point. I, I see my dreams shattered in front of my eyes. I, I feel sorry for myself. I hate the fact that there are murmurs around me about my choices. I hate the fact that the reviews in the papers are so terrible. It's, it's, it's tough, it's tough to see that. Uh, it was a really low point for me and um, Suddenly, you know, uh, all these B-grade films start coming my way. Uh, cheesy plots, horrible dialogue. And that's not how I saw things for myself. I was someone who wanted to be relevant. I wanted to be part of cinema that is relevant. And I had all these, um, this ambitious kid, you know, who had all these ideas in my head. And I was being more offered these repulsive scripts. I said, I said no to all of them. And, uh, it was a time when the Tory in me got really moody. Uh, I became sort of dark, brooding. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I, I, I had anger. Uh, I think I had anger issues at the time. I, I was angry uh, at the world. I was angry at myself for making the choice that I did. And the choice not of becoming an actor, but choosing the film. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a dark, dark time for me. Um, anyway, finally, I think I, I, I get a hold of myself and I decide that, so I've taken a hit, so what? Let's start over. I get my focus back, put on my blinkers, go out there, start auditioning feverishly, meeting people, doing, doing, doing things that I should be doing. And you know what? It, it starts working out. I sign a play, a, a, a TV series and an international film all within the month. It's like the, the universe is, is helping me again. And it's, 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 I'm, I'm ecstatic. It's, it's surprising, but it's, it's beautiful. So, um, well, so that's how the journey sort of began. And, uh, today I'm, I'm a workaholic. I love what I do. I've, I've constantly been doing this ever since that time. It's, it's, it's been a while. And um, there's not a day that goes by that I don't wake up thankful for being able to do what I love. Even though I'm, I'm doing beyond an actor now, you know, I'm branching out, but um, I found my peace with my choices. And I'm very grateful that I got the opportunity, I took it. 
because even though look i'm not i don't claim to be a big star i don't claim to be the most popular guy in fact some of you may never have seen my work but i've also somebody who's always had work as an actor uh, until this covid era of course when things have been slightly weird but up until then uh, it's it's a big thing to be a working actor in my profession because it's a tough profession so if you are working that's pretty cool and then of course if you get to a level of stardom etc that's even cooler but i take pride in that and i'm at peace with that so i think i've talked enough about myself Uh, but what I want to make you aware of that while I spoke about my journey, what I did was I used the Navrasa. The Navrasa, the nine basic human emotions. Uh, they are love, laughter, fear, uh, courage, sorrow, uh, disgust, anger, wonder, and peace. And the reason I used those emotions was uh, because it was just a, a slight display of my craft as an actor, uh, which I used. while I was expressing my thoughts and expressing my journey to you you see as a kid i was weak in communication and that's what the arts has done that's what acting has done it's helped me communicate better it can help you become better at public speaking you know uh, the arts helps you reach within yourself tap into your own human emotions and uh, connect with the world around you with other living beings other humans understand the world better it 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 sensitizes you to what's happening around you and i think in this frantic world that we live it's important it's necessary it's the arts is such a great release so whether you take up music painting acting whatever i truly 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 believe that it will make you more rounded person it will make you a better person it's better for your own soul it's better for everyone around you so i strongly recommend you to be involved in the arts um try out a few different things see what you like and it gets more challenging as you grow older but it's also more rewarding as you grow older uh, being involved in the arts so um well thank you for having me i'm sid makkar i'm a proud student of bombay national school and i actually look forward uh, to answering your questions Thanks so much Sid. You're so right. Art helps you know yourself and grow yourself as well. Um I just want to reiterate to all the attendees what I said at the beginning of this event. Um if you have any questions please write them in the chat box that you can see um the chat window that you can see on your screen. Uh and all questions will be answered in a either in a speaker Q&A at the end of all of the talks or in um in a breakout room that you can choose to join into which I'll give you more information about later. So now we can move on to our next speaker. Uh our next speaker has your next holiday sorted. I'm sure many of you have heard of Vista Rooms and if not I suggest you check it out. They create beautiful holiday homes which you can rent with friends and family and they are currently the largest hospitality brand for home stays in India. Here with us is the co-founder of Vista Rooms from the BIS class of 2004 Amit Damani. Good evening everyone. The lady that you see is Kamla Devi. She grew up in Varanasi on a large estate with beautiful gardens as a personal playing ground. As life would have it, she got married and moved from a haveli into a one-room apartment in Calcutta that she shared with 10 other people. Her family ran into financial troubles and had to give up the house and the large estate including the gardens that they had. Her loving husband made her one promise that one day he would buy her a home where she could have the kind of garden she had while growing up it took 40 years but he kept his word in the hills of lonavla he built a second home and gifted it to her as he had committed they visited often by themselves or with their grandchildren until his health took a downturn and he consequently passed away kamla devi held this place close to her heart 
and the house now held immense sentimental value for her. She didn't visit as often anymore, and the grandchildren too had grown up and moved away to study. Because of the deep attachment to her house, there was no question of selling it. And despite her age, 75 at the time, which is about five years ago, she was still making trips just to ensure the home was maintained. Despite the complete support of her children, the unending expenses on a property that was barely even used was a bother to her. Her grandson, that's me, suggested opening it up to guests as a means to be financially independent while putting the place to use to ensure better upkeep. Her hesitation was surprisingly short-lived. She saw the benefits and agreed, but with only one caveat, that it would stay a vegetarian home. Each home has its story, a labor of love for many that unfortunately turns into a white elephant over time, as this aspirational purchase turns into a money pit. That is where we step in as Vista. We take over all the hassles of hosting and turn an expense incurring asset to an income generating one for homeowners. On the other hand, we offer access to these beautiful homes for groups and families to get away. Sure, one could browse and book places off any crowdsource platform like Airbnb, but we found that guests value the curation, quality assurance and service that we offer at Vista. Thankfully, the execution of this idea wasn't limited to my grandmother's faith in me. We now have over 500 homeowners from Kasoli to Kochi who have trusted us with their home. Investors such as DSG Consumer Partners have shown faith in our business model and Vista is now the largest hospitality brand for holiday home rentals in India. When I sum it up like that, it sounds like a dream run. And sure, it has been. If you can loosen the definition enough to include nightmares. Statistically, about 90% of startups fail and keeping ourselves in the top 10% has taken a lot of hard work. There is one big secret to it and I'll share that shortly. If you're familiar with what Darwin has to say is the key to survival, then you already know the one single word that I'm building up to. When we started Vista, we were in the same space as Oyo and Tribo. We worked with small hotels in tier two, tier three cities of India, with a market driven by minimum guarantees and money being thrown at hotel owners. Money became the critical factor to compete and even attempt to control guest experience. We frankly didn't have the financial muscle to compete in such a market. We had to take hard calls of laying off people and letting an office space go. We either had to shut shop or we had to find a way to pivot. And yes, it was just as frantic as this. We believed in ourselves as a team and decided to stick it out together. At that point, I think our motto was as simple as try and try until you succeed. Cliché, I'll admit, but the only one that made sense for us then. From review capturing systems for hotels to selling food on Zomato and Swiggy, we tried everything. We even launched in Sri Lanka and spent a year and a half building our base there. After a couple of years of experimenting, we still hadn't gained a foothold anywhere and were running out of money. Around this time, a family friend reached out to check if being in the hospitality business, we could do something to help him manage his second home in Lunabla. From what it looked like on the surface, this segment wasn't going to be a viable business model for us. We were under the impression that people only go to holiday homes on the weekend and assume maybe there'll be usage of homes for four to six days in a month. On the upside though, Yo was an owner who was more concerned about quality and experience and needed support in ways that we felt capable of offering. This was completely different from what we'd seen in the hotel space where minimum guarantees was the only thing a hotelier was looking for. Personally, the time spent with family and friends at our holiday home formed some of my most cherished memories. The thought of extending the same opportunity to others excited me in a very real way. On the global front, with how Airbnb was gaining ground and changing the way people travel, we could see the demand for such stays increasing in India as well, as people became more aware of the option and saw the benefits of choosing homes over hotels. Singing ABCD on a bus while traveling with a family of 20 on a honeymoon was only a slight exaggeration compared to what most Indians actually love doing, that is traveling in groups. 
Hotels don't offer the kind of private common areas for these groups to interact in the way homes can. Having access to a kitchen is a big plus, especially for those traveling with senior citizens or infants. The entire experience is far more customizable to one's needs than a hotel stay could ever be. So what started with my family friend and my grandmother's home scaled to over 300 Vista Partner homes in 2020. Things were going well. We had built the largest brand of boutique holiday home rentals and were preparing for the next phase of growth. Enter COVID. Absolutely unanticipated and utterly cruel to a business like ours. The entire world was brought to a standstill and uncertainty loomed large. With lockdowns in place and no travel whatsoever, our revenues came down to a big fat zero overnight. Lacking prior pandemic experience, we had no way to estimate when things would happen or any semblance of novelty would return. We did what we knew best, tried and tried and went back to saying why not to every opportunity. We had a large team this time around and were surprised by how in sync with this attitude all of them seemed to be. Times were hard, but this collective resiliency made it easier. We put in a lot of thought and deep dive into the why of what we do. Celebrations, reunions, corporate offsites were some of the key reasons why guests would stay with us. We took this experience online by creating virtual celebrations and team bonding activities on Zoom. We served over 100 companies in making their teams reconnect through games and activities online. We organized over 50 birthdays. Although it made measly amounts of revenue for us, it kept our team engaged and was a valued service for other companies struggling to keep their employees and families motivated. As prizes, we offered future credits for Vista stays in the brave faith that we would outlive this pandemic. Besides, Completely unrelated to what Vista does as a business, we also help frontline workers, doctors and essential service providers with taxi services when all forms of public transport had come to a halt. Contributing their help towards the need of the hour made our team feel united towards a worthy cause and kept us going. With respect to travel, things were fundamentally changing globally. Work from home allowed people to work from anywhere. With schools closed, people could continue to study from anywhere. Instead of being cooped up in small apartments, people seek to escape to holiday homes. We saw this trend play out globally and knew that as soon as restrictions were even partially lifted, people would be lining up to stay at holiday homes and we started preparing for this. With homes being closed for several months, various maintenance issues cropped up. Taps, ACs, lawns, pools and several other amenities needed to be repaired across 300 plus homes. We had to virtually prepare staff who stayed in these small towns and had not really been exposed to the new normal. We even had to adapt to what a holiday home experience meant as guests now saw this as not just a holiday home, but a way to live, spending multiple weeks to months at holiday homes. Rather than it being a means to disconnect, being able to stay connected to their work became critical. We had to start setting up high-speed Wi-Fi at all our homes and ensure there are workspaces as well. After three, four months of waiting, when lockdowns eased, it felt like the floodgates had opened. When COVID struck, it hit us hard, but things got better. We saw the kind of demand that we'd never seen before. The numbers were looking great. And of course, that brought us relief, knowing we will be able to pay all the salaries, bring back those we had to follow and get back to work. But at a time where people were still dealing with a lot, what meant most to us was the fact that young kids, senior citizens who were most at risk, who hadn't stepped out of their apartments in months, were finally able to catch a breath of fresh air and live freely at homes. They had large spaces, a pool to jump into, open lawns to walk around and without worrying about risk of being exposed to the virus. The biggest secret of survival? Adaptability. Whether it's the entire human race in the face of this pandemic or us as a business through our various challenges, the only way to make it through is to adapt. On a personal note, my grandmother's story probably needs its own separate talk. But I'll tell you this much. It is a true testament to the resilience of humans. I've always admired her ability to mold herself in accordance with the situations she has faced 
and if i'm able to stay brave and run a resilient business that grows from strength to strength owing to its adaptability you'll know where i learned it from thank you thank you amit i have actually stayed at one of your homes and it was really a wonderful experience um to anyone who may have joined late i'll reiterate please type any questions for the speakers into the chat window these will be answered by our speaker panel at the end of the talks or in individual breakout rooms with the speakers so now our next speaker who over here is a fan of sachin tendulkar virat kohli or mary poppins I'm sure it's many of you. Our next speaker has worked with them and several other sports heroes of India. He has over 15 years of experience in varied roles across many sports from the class of 2001, Janet Desai. Before I started working in sport, I had the good fortune of getting to go to Sachin Tendulkar's house for a meet and greet. At the time, Sachin was the biggest sports star this country had ever seen, and from the mid '90s, his face adorned everything from soaps to sports cars. I was teeming with excitement as I was getting a chance to meet my sporting hero. When we reached, Sachin was at home. He had dropped everything to go and meet an old ailing fan whose last wish was to meet Sachin Tendulkar. We settled ourselves on his sofas and waited for Sachin to arrive, looking at all the trophies and accolades that adorned the walls. And then the moment arrived as greatness entered the room. I was spellbound and could barely utter a hi. The man just walks in and introduces himself. Hi, I'm Sachin. Casually pulling a chair from the table and settling down to chat with us over a cup of tea. He was one of the biggest stars of the country, one of the most in-demand people in the world. who had dropped everything to go and meet a dying fan and was now sitting and talking to two young kids over a cup of tea with no air or attitude over the course of time i've met and worked with many less sports stars with a lot more air and attitude i always think back to the time i met sachin tendulkar and the humility and humaneness that he carried himself with that was my first taste of encountering greatness from behind the curtain and made me realize that just human like you and me and that picked my interest into what goes on into creating a sporting superstar and that interest and wonder hasn't changed over the past 14 years of working in the indian sports industry where i currently juggle my role as a father of two with online homeschool as well as looking after the virat kohli foundation at cornerstone sport one of india's leading talent management agencies a lot of what i do at the virat kohli foundation is shaped for by my time at indian at the indian cricket league olympic gold quest and fc goa and the people and sports stars that i worked with and i'll be sharing a few stories from my time and what it has taught me sport has always been my solace either playing or watching it has always been my sanctuary as long as i can remember and my journey into the world of indian sport began with a stint at the indian rebel indian cricket league managing the branding and marketing of the league After a fun year and a half the league folded and I then moved on to Olympic Gold Quest an NGO that was formed to help support Indian athletes to win medals at the Olympics as probably one of the most satisfying experiences of my life and also the pride of playing a small part in the journey of four Olympic medalists is something I will cherish my whole life My journey at OGQ began in 2009 where I got the chance to work with former India hockey captain Viren Raskina Virin had a prolific hockey career, winning the Junior World Cup, representing India at the 2004 Athens Olympics, and eventually going on to become the captain of the national team. A bit of bad luck and petty politics meant that Virin was unceremoniously dropped from the national team a day before they were to depart for a tournament. Virin hit out at the IHF, and in those days, if you spoke out, you were out. Probably realizing his playing days were over. Virin took the unprecedented step of retiring from the peak of his powers when he was only 29. But Virin had other plans. He enrolled into the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad to pursue an MBA. He put his head down and passed with flying colors, securing a job at one of India's biggest healthcare companies. 
but life had other plans. At the time, Olympic Gold Quest was looking for a CEO. And through some common connects, Virain was identified as a man for the job. He's been at the job for the 12 years and has helped Indian athletes win 9 medals at the past 3 Olympics and 10 medals at the 2020 Paralympics, building one of the foremost organizations in Indian sport. And I had the pleasure of spending 5 of them with him and learning so much from him. The corporate world was new to him, but the way he picked it up so naturally and set up systems and processes at OGQ, which still hold strong today and I continue to use in my current role at the foundation. I guess leadership was always in his blood, whether on the field or in the office. And even today, when I need to speak to someone, Virain is my go-to guy. At my time in OGQ, I got the chance to work with some amazing sports people and got to see from close quarters what it takes to become an Olympic medalist. Gagan Narang was the first ever athlete we supported at OGQ and he's been destined for Olympic glory. This is a story from the 2012 Olympics in the men's 10 meter air rifle event. It was also my first taste of the magic of the Olympics as I was lucky to be in London at the time. Gagan shot brilliantly in the qualification and qualified for the finals in third place. Between the qualification and the final is a 45 minute gap where the shooters are with their coaches in a holding area while the finals range is set up. I was with Gagan's mental trainer at the time and we were making our way to our seats in the finals range when Gagan's personal coach came running frantically towards us. Gagan wanted to talk to the mental trainer before the final. Well, unfortunately, he did not have an accreditation and only the coach had one. So the coach used his years of experience and a moment of quick thinking to get him into the holding area. He made him put on a second haversack in the front to cover the part where the ID would have been and told him to confidently walk behind him. Gagan was calm, the medal was won. It was probably one of the best experiences in my life. And there have been many moments, especially working in sport, when you gotta hustle and think on your feet to make it happen. After my time at OGQ, I got the chance to join FC Goa for the inaugural season of the Indian Super League. At FC Goa, we had French World Cup winner and Arsenal legend Robert Perez as our marquee player and captain. The start of the first season was disastrous with FC Goa struggling to get off the mark. Perez was way past his prime by then and was on the wrong side of 37. The vision was there but the skills, is, skills had faded. He was dropped from the starting 11, never to get his place back and a new captain was appointed. The change worked and his team started winning, eventually losing on penalties in the semi-final. Unfortunately for Robert, he never got another chance to play. Still, in that one and a half period, he never missed a training session, photo shoot, team event, team dinner, etc. But what stood out were, was his mannerisms during the training sessions, never letting the intensity drop, putting in his all and helping the young Indians with his knowledge, even though he didn't have a chance of making it back to the team. Here was a footballing legend who had played in some of the biggest leagues in the world, had won everything. Here in a fledgling league in the 100th ranked footballing country in the world, dropped from this team, still giving it his all. And that experience had a lasting impact on me and my thought process towards work and life. The also, the buzz of being around a team and the frenzy in Goa on match days is something I'll always remember fondly. Spent an amazing four years at the club, so many ups and downs, but memories to last a lifetime. Well, this has been a part of my journey until now and there's lots more I'd have loved to tell you. And there's still lots more to do. Over the years, I've had the good fortune of working with many amazing sports people, including PV Sindhu, Abhinav Bindra, Neeraj Chopra, Sanya Mirza, Saina Nehwal, KL Rahul, Geet Sethi, Prakash Padukone, Sunil Chetri, Virat Kohli, and many more. And each interaction with these legends has had a telling impact on me and helped shape my career in sport. I hope through these stories, I've managed to give you a small peek into what goes on behind greatness and what lessons I've learned along the way. And I hope I have managed to impart some of my graying, balding wisdom on y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. It was so inspiring to get a, get a glimpse of what goes behind greatness. 
Our next speaker today is a self-taught artist who had the courage to pivot his career after spending nearly a decade as a finance professional. And he makes very cool custom sneakers. Here to talk about his journey of self-discovery from the class of 2000, Aditya Krishnamurti. Whenever I've been fortunate enough to uh, to interact with an established artist, I viewed it as an opportunity to seek advice and to get feedback on my work, um, secretly hoping that they'd turn around and say that my work is amazing and that I was on the right track. Um, but the recurring takeaway has almost always been um, that I need to find my voice. Um, and my recurring uh, reaction has almost always been one of frustration, and irritation and and doubt, uh, but also deep down knowing exactly what they meant. Um, finding my voice has been a journey uh, process which has involved a deep introspection of every aspect of my life, um, decisions, actions, attitude, everything. Um, the process of self-discovery has been an incredibly humbling and challenging one, um, and at times mentally and physically consuming. Uh, but it is, in my opinion, an imperative um, and one that arguably applies to any walk of life, uh, be it becoming an artist, uh, an entrepreneur uh, or a professional in any field. Uh, through my experiences and learnings on this journey so far, um, I hope I can encourage uh, you to discover yourself and to find your own voice. Often the first question that I am asked by those intrigued in my story is what made me want to quit finance? And thinking back at the various roles I held as a finance professional, I now recognize that I was I had merely existed in the comfort zone. Um, I was successful, no doubt. Um, and by that, I mean I'd achieved career progression and uh, a certain level of financial security and stability. However, I never had that desire to, to you know to push myself to to go beyond this comfort zone and stretch myself not just to be uh, good at what I do but to be the best of myself um, and uh, there were of course instances when this desire did kick in and those moments uh, were different um, the satisfaction from achieving success in those moments was special uh, but these were rare and in truth I had let myself uh, slip into a state of stasis uh, recognizing and accepting my predicament didn't occur overnight and neither did the process of getting myself out. Um, there were many contributing factors that actually led me to my decision, but uh, tearing my ACL ligament in my left knee was the event that actually put things in context for me. Um, the injury hit me particularly hard because for the longest time, um, uh, perhaps even more than my artistic pursuits, my athletic ability was central to my identity, um, both for myself as well as how others viewed me. Um, you know, whenever I would run into a schoolmate from BIS, particularly a junior, uh, I mean, they would recognize me as ADK the runner. And now the mere thought of, you know, possibly never being able to run again um, at the same level that I used to be able to was uh, was frightening and uh, frankly it felt like a threat to my sense of self and to my sense of identity and I realized that just like sport was integral to my identity um, finance was not at all and um, so in June 2016 I decided to quit finance and uh, rediscover my sense of identity and self in art, in art. During the first few months of uh, you know being an artist, I felt an incredible sense of uh, liberation. I was filled with energy and optimism, um, and having made up my mind to go down the path of being a self-taught artist, I got to work right away, studying, researching, uh, taking online courses, and exploring what seemed like an endless uh, stream of uh, possibilities and opportunities, all worth pursuing. Um, I was very fortunate um, to receive a couple of lucky breaks almost immediately after I had made my move uh, to being an artist and uh, this included an opportunity to illustrate three children's books. Um, 
and I, this was a great way for me to uh, reacquaint myself with the pencil, pen, and paper, and practice mark making. Uh, but more importantly, it also made my decision to become an artist feel real. Um, in addition to the illustration projects, I received commissions from friends and well-wishers, uh, which all served as a great confidence booster and uh, an, an opportunity also to experiment with materials and different media. I began work on my first major commission in September of 2017. Um, the brief was simple and very flexible. It's an open brief to simply create a large scale non-figurative artwork. It uh, was going to be the largest canvas that I'd ever worked on. In fact, I struggled quite a bit to even get it to fit in my studio. Um, uh, so I knew it was going to be challenging in terms of the execution. Uh, but it was a fantastic chance for me to really express myself and uh, make some serious progress in my quest to find my artistic voice. Um, the inspiration for the work hit me while reading a book by Alan Burdick uh, titled uh, Why Time Flies and uh, his writing on circadian rhythms particularly um, formed the core concept um, of the work. Um, well. Time did fly and it took me almost eight months to complete the work, which finally um, spanned four feet in height and 12 feet in length. Um, the execution process was both physically and mentally uh, intense and I spent days at a stretch in the studio, um, isolated and completely immersed. Um, uh, the work did take a lot out of me and unsurprisingly, when I finally completed it, I felt a great sense of pride and happiness. Um, and more so because the client was extremely satisfied. Um, however, the feeling of joy was quite short lived and that was something I was not really prepared for. Um, the post completion kind of happiness was replaced by uncertainty and doubt. Um, unsure of whether it accurately represented who I am. Um, I was unwilling to commit to the form of expression and style that I had used in the commission. Um, and as a result, I felt extremely deflated um, because I, was, I wondered, I mean, had I spent all that time and effort and energy uh, all for nothing? Um, Self-doubt is often a part of a creative process, uh, but I found myself unable to move beyond it. Um, and uh, I didn't accept it at the time. Uh, but the root of the problem uh, lay in, in, in how I chose to approach my practice. Um, I had somehow convinced myself that extreme isolation uh, was the only way I would truly discover my own voice. And um, I even justified my situation as being, you know, maybe I was in the struggling, quote unquote, struggling artist phase. Um, but I knew, however, that uh, that my approach was not sustainable, it was imbalanced, and um, a change was definitely uh, in order. Sometimes it's just not possible to muster up the will or the conviction to effect change from within, and in these circumstances, an external change needs to be forced upon you. Um, this, For me, this change was delivered in the form of the pandemic and the lockdowns that followed. Um, Having grown accustomed to a creative process that's built on, on isolation, my initial reaction to the pandemic and enforced lockdown and uh, the idea of working from home uh, was one of fearful resignation that I just would not be able to create uh, and produce any art. Um, instead, it turned out to be exactly the kind of change uh, that I needed. Uh, being at home with family and uh, helping to deal with the challenges uh, born out of a constantly evolving uh, situation forced me to take my mind uh, and thoughts off art in my practice and uh, something, this was something I was unable to do voluntarily while I was holed up in my studio. I almost felt like I was constantly switched on and, and I was never able to give my mind a rest. Uh, the forced mental break from art um, allowed my mind to recuperate in many ways, to, to reset. And uh, this combined with a more flexible and adaptive mindset, uh, something all of us may have had to sort of 
uh, pick up to adjust to the new normal. Um, uh, th all of this allowed me to view things from a fresh perspective. Um, and I was able to take stock of, my, of the progress I'd made on my journey um, uh, so far. Um, a reconfigured approach and thought process helped me also to create a new works that resulted in two small, uh, two small yet cohesive series of works. Um, and the first of the two sets is an extension of the Commission on Circadian Rhythms, which is particularly significant for me personally, as it also gave me a clear signal that I was no longer unsure uh, of whether um, the style and the artwork speaks to who I am and my identity as an artist. A relatively more unexpected yet equally important step that I took during the pandemic uh, was uh, to look for a creative outlet outside of my core practice. Um, for lack of a better term, I was looking for a kind of fun side hustle. Um, and knowing that I had a, a passion for shoes and a love for shoes, uh, my wife Radhima on multiple occasions had, had encouraged me to look up a well-known sneaker artist and customizer called The Shoe Surgeon. Um, I eventually did and when I did I immediately knew that this is the kind of um, creative outlet that I was looking for. Um, maybe I shouldn't be surprised because it seems like I made my first uh, custom sneaker mock-up back in 1997. Um, while I was still in BIS. Probably did it while I was in a class or something like that. <laughs> um, I, while I've only just kind of scratched the surface in terms of the custom sneaker, sneaker art um, activity, uh, having only made a handful of sneakers till date, um, I can say without any hesitation um, that it was absolutely the right move. Uh, because it's brought in an element of un unadulterated fun uh, to my creative process and uh, in an overall sense it's brought in balance to my practice. Um, yeah, so the, the last five years have been an absolute wild ride. Um, I mean, it's been, been exciting, scary, frustrating, um, but more than anything else it's been deeply rewarding. And uh, the search for my voice will continue, um, and maybe maybe it isn't meant to end at all. Um, but I'm hopeful that it will continue to evolve uh, in many wonderful and unexpected ways. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Aditya. They say the only way to find your voice is to use it. And you've already used it to create some really incredible art. Okay, our final alum speaker for the day is not only an alum, but also a BIS parent. Her son, Mihan, graduated from BIS earlier this year. Mihan was born with Down syndrome, but Monisha is here to share her experience that disability is just a construct. From the class of 1988, Manisha Gandhi. My son Mihan graduated from BIS earlier this year. Something I never dreamed he'd be able to do when he was born 17 years ago with Down syndrome. Hearing his diagnosis at birth was like a stab through our hearts. One of those life-changing moments after which you know that nothing will ever be the same. But after the initial heartbreak came a journey of discovery and new ways of viewing the world. Today, I look back with pity at that person that I was, devastated and terrified about what life would be like for us and our child. And I wish I could tell that former self what I know now that he'd bring more joy into our lives than we could ever imagine, and that he'd surprise us and surpass expectations every step of the way. So why was I so terrified? It's because we were completely clueless about Down syndrome and disability in general. For those of you who may not be familiar with Down syndrome, it's a genetic condition that causes developmental delays and intellectual disability. 
And here we were for the first time staring it in the face of our beautiful baby boy. Up until the birth of our son, I don't think I'd ever had any meaningful interaction with a person with disability. Growing up, I was aware of special schools, places that kids with disabilities attended, but they inhabited a whole separate universe from the one I lived in. And I admit on the few occasions that I did meet someone with a disability, I was uncomfortable and fearful, not knowing quite what to say or how to engage. I imagine that many people of my generation will relate to this, to the idea that disabled people were essentially different from us. But having Mihan in my life has completely changed the way I view disability. It's made me stop seeing disability as binary, disabled versus non-disabled, us versus them, or something alien and separate from myself. Living with Mihan has made me see that disability is something that exists in degrees, and there are shades of it in all of us. Let me describe an anecdote from a few years ago. Mihan was around 10 years old when the Rubik's Cube made a comeback in schools. Mihan watched mesmerized as his sister and several classmates tried to solve it. When he requested that we buy him one, we did, but in my mind, I thought we were just being indulgent. Sure, he was a capable kid considering his learning difficulties, but the complex multi-step approach to solving even one side was something I was pretty sure was way beyond his ability. After all, this was a kid who could only do the most elementary math and hell, even I couldn't solve it. So when he excitedly showed me a solved face, I'm ashamed to say I did not believe he had done it himself. I asked him several times if his sister had helped and only believed it when I jumbled it up for him and he solved it as I watched, awestruck. In the months that followed, he was single-minded in his pursuit to solve the whole thing. I was used to helping Mihan with schoolwork, but here I was beyond my depth. His sister, school friends, dad weren't able to help beyond a point. So eventually he turned to an online tutorial and taught himself to solve it a pretty stunning feat for a young boy with Down syndrome. I believe this story illustrates well how many people with special needs have ability levels that are mixed. Mihan isn't great at math, but clearly has excellent spatial problem-solving abilities. He struggles to button his shirt and tie his shoelaces, but those same fingers can turn that cube with great ease. He takes extra time to complete a biology or history test, but is super quick with witty comebacks. He might have a learning disability, but constantly says the wisest things, such as, I'm not studying for marks, mama, I'm studying for life. And we often joke about what a guru he is. So think about it. Isn't it kind of the same with the rest of us? Aren't we too good at some things, but have areas that we're really terrible at and have needed additional help for? I know a few of mine. I'm terribly anxious about speaking in public. I break into a cold sweat if I have to address a group. Thankfully, this video is pre-recorded. I have a pathologically bad sense of direction. I'm not so quick with numbers. Don't we all have a disability? Isn't it just a matter of degree? When we view disability in this manner, it becomes plain to see why inclusive schools make sense. In classrooms, children vary greatly in ability, with typical kids falling along a curve. It's obvious then that catering to the outliers on this curve will benefit several others along the same continuum. So when inclusion is done effectively, the class as a whole can benefit. Additional support that's put in for kids like Nihan can be utilized by other kids. In inclusive classrooms, teachers think out of the box and use alternative modes of teaching that cater to varied learning styles and abilities. And this ends up helping several kids. All of this is borne out by research, which indicates that typical students in inclusive classrooms often end up making better academic progress in reading and math compared to those in non-inclusive classrooms. This is because inclusive schools challenge conventional one-size-fit-all teaching methods. They bring in a culture where all children are valued and efforts are made to accommodate every child. Sure, this comes with additional effort, but it yields rich dividends. Several countries have realized the benefits of inclusive education decades ago and have legislated to make it mandatory. 
sadly in India we are far behind. Most schools in fact make no apologies about testing kids to admit only those who they judge to be the brightest. I hope that BIS being the trailblazer it's always been can lead the way in changing some of those outdated attitudes. It took having Mihan to open my eyes to see not a disabled person but instead a person for whom disability is one amongst many facets of their persona. I'd like to think that Mihan's classmates learned this lesson far earlier than me and would use down syndrome as just one of many adjectives to describe him and see a boy who is essentially more like them than different. They are his biggest cheerleaders and teachers. They make no conscious efforts to include him. He's just one of their gang. And I'm sure that they'll very naturally contribute to a more inclusive world. Mihan wants to be many things, a chef, a YouTuber, an author. I have no doubt that he'll achieve his dreams. Being an articulate and confident young man, he'll also be a great advocate for disability rights. Perhaps one day he'll be here giving a BIS talk and really challenge the preconceived notions that people hold about individuals with special needs. Thanks so much for that, Monisha. As you said, what divides us pales in comparison to what unites us. So that's it today from our alum speakers. Now it is my absolute pleasure to invite some of our current grade 10 BIS students to share their thought provoking ideas. First up, talking about the importance of space exploration is Nikhil Trivedi. So I was watching a reel on Instagram the other day of some spectacular footage of a rocket launch. And it really irked me to see things like, why are we wasting money on space when we're, we've got so many problems to solve right here on Earth, among the most liked comments. In the words of Mark Rober, a YouTuber and former NASA engineer, that's equivalent to our ancestors asking, why should we waste time developing agriculture when we're so busy hunting and gathering? There are currently over 150 different Earth observation satellites in orbit, providing us with everything from GPS to weather and crop monitoring data to detailed analysis of air quality and ocean salinity. Additionally, there have been nearly 3000 different experiments conducted about the International Space Station alone to date, each of which have advanced our knowledge and directly or indirectly have influenced innovation. Ultimately, space exploration benefits our own lives right here on Earth. On the 24th of November, a 550 kg refrigerator sized satellite called DART was launched into space. Its mission? To crash into an asteroid millions of kilometers away and deflect it off course. Now don't worry, this asteroid wasn't headed for Earth. But the point is, a relatively large asteroid impact can very easily cause human extinction. Now, we're fairly certain that an asteroid large enough isn't headed our way in the next century or so, but it is only inevitable. Space exploration provides us with a threefold plan to prevent such an eventuality. Firstly, an early warning system to detect such an asteroid beforehand, which has already been set up. Secondly, a method to prevent such a collision by deflecting the asteroid off, of course, such as DART. And thirdly, whether it be Elon Musk's dreams of a self-sustaining city on Mars or Jeff Bezos' vision of human cities in space. Space exploration provides us with a backup if such a collision with Earth cannot be prevented. Besides protecting our species, I believe space exploration is the single greatest force of inspiration today. Images such as the pale blue dot provide us with an unparalleled perspective of the bigger picture. Whereas those such as the Hubble Deep Fields capture the very boundaries of space and time possible in visible light. Ever since ancient civilizations first arose, humans have been obsessed with what lies beyond the night sky. Innately, innately attracted to gazing up at the night sky, gazing up at the stars and pondering the questions how and why. Perhaps hoping, believing that the answers lay written among them.
Space exploration brings us but one step closer. A small step for a man though it may be, a great leap for all mankind. Thank you, Nikhil. Our next student speaker's talk is about the importance of doing nothing. Here is Radhika Jain. Most of us are addicted to always doing something even if what we're doing may not be productive. What if we instead deliberately created pockets of time in our day where we did nothing? Is there merit in being idle, both in mind and body? We've all experienced empty brain syndrome, where you can't think of anything useful, even though the impending doom of a history submission awaits you. The remedy seems to always strike at midnight, when you're trying to go to sleep, but all you can do is think. Your mind meanders through a myriad of thoughts, micro-analyzing the day's conversations, which does help enhance your literature analysis skills, but mostly leads to panic. As your subconscious slowly moves to rest, your mind empties out, and suddenly, the entire transcript for your history assignment just magically appears. Many believe that this untimely arrival of much-needed information is just our brains being stubborn, but truly, the answer is deeply rooted in science. The magic of doing nothing has exhibited itself throughout history, whether that be through Archimedes' lazy bath leading to the discovery of the concept of density, or the idea for the speech coming to me while I was trying to fall asleep the night before a chemistry test. It almost feels as though you're stealing someone else's thoughts, as they are so uncharacteristic of everything you think about during the day. And why? It's because doing nothing allows your subconscious to expand and make new connections which just means that the part of your brain that you don't actively think with when occupied is growing when you do nothing, boosting creativity and hence allowing your ideas to emerge from the haze. Now, for all the procrastinators like me out there, by saying do nothing, I don't mean scrolling through Instagram or checking out your entire contact book's profile pictures. Doing nothing truly just means sitting on a sofa and staring at the ceiling. Your brain needs to be completely unoccupied. I know it's hard, with notifications and the mere sight of your phone taunting you, but as I can see how much you've enjoyed this speech, I'd say it's well worth it. Thank you. Thanks, Radhika. Finally, to tell us about the importance of an treating animals equally to humans, here is Tanay Daftari. We have the capability to feel emotions, perceive pain and torture, and distinguish between mistreatment and love. We mourn the loss of others, express sorrow over parting with our families and friends, and strive for better opportunities. So who is to say that animals who breathe, sense, and opt for survival, just like us, don't experience these things too? As humans, we cannot tolerate remaining in our homes, as the last few months have proven. We need space and freedom, and so do all those animals who are in zoos, who are incarcerated by metal bars, and have to bear through the torment of loud passerbys every single day for the rest of their lives, whilst having nothing to do but walk back and forth, back and forth in an empty cage, away from their families and away from the sunny savannas, with the smell of fresh grass and the taste of sweet cold water near an interrupting tree to days on. Chickens, cows, fish, they're all bred in captivity, born to be slaughtered and tortured in the unhygienic, pain-inducing and restricting conditions of a factory farm. Moreover, it is heart rendering for us to move out of such a home that we have lived in for so long. Just imagine a deer or a leopard losing one with no place else to go. The destruction of the Amazon rainforest, an enchanted, aged and peaceful home for so many different species, 
the melting of ice, important to the habitats of polar bears and penguins, and the pollution of oceans with waste and dangerous toxins. They all demonstrate our greed and how we prioritize our comfort over the lives of our fellow beings. In biology, we study the characteristics of living things, although at times we forget that animals are living beings just like us. As Anthony Douglas Williams said, not a single creature on earth has more or less right to be here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tanay. So that concludes our talks for 2021. I hope you have enjoyed them as much as I have. Now we will move, move on to a speaker panel where the speakers will answer some of your questions. Thank you for all of the questions you've shared so far. The talks team has been working behind the background to select two questions per speaker, which I will read out and ask them. If your question has not been selected, however, please ask it in the breakout rooms, which will take place after this panel Q&A. The purpose of the breakout rooms is to introduce that element of a casual chat that you would have been able to have if we were doing this event in person. So um, Sid, I'll start with you. The first question, which I'm gonna read out is, um, it's not easy to make a career as an artist. The percentage of people who find success is small. What advice would you give to a parent whose child wants to follow their dream, but also needs to make ends meet? Hi, am I audible now? Yeah. So, um, look, I personally um, have only worked as an actor, when I started out, I was sort of driven and I came from the place where I felt like, you know, if you know what you want to do, you give it everything and there's no second option. Having said that, my, my thoughts have changed over time. Um, now, especially during the COVID era, I felt like, you know what, I should have maybe um, had a side hustle. Because when there were certain times, you know, where there were dips in the career, it would have been helpful. Uh, so I advise that if you are trying to make a career as an artist, I think that's a, I think somebody, one of the speakers even mentioned that of a side hustle. I think that's a good idea. Having said that, if, if, if I was a parent and if my kid uh, showed an interest in something, I would definitely make sure that the kid pursues it because, Hey, you know what? You really don't know if you don't try. So, the only way you're going to know is if you go towards it. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sid. I think I, I totally agree with you. I think... Uh, 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 okay, I'm going to move on to the next um, question, which is to uh, Amit. Amit, um, the question is, how do you decide when to make, when to make a pivot and change the course of the business? Is there an inflection point? Um, so I think when we went through sort of those existential crisis questions in our mind, um, it was primarily driven by, you know, sort of looking at what's happening on a month on month growth from a business point of view. Uh, I think more than when uh, we decided to make a pivot, what we were very conscious about was how we made a pivot. Uh, what I mean by that is that I think as human beings, you're not comfortable with sudden shocks in the system. Um, so the idea wasn't to like just shut down what was happening earlier and start something afresh, but uh, start your side hustles or start your uh, sort of side projects for teams, find someone in the team who can drive those projects. And uh, as, as and when those start scaling and uh, seem to work, you kind of start shifting the team more and more towards that. Uh, so that's how we approached it. Thank you so much. I mean, I really thought your idea of during the pandemic hosting those Zoom meetings and stuff for companies and then giving them stays as a gift was a great one. Um, so my next question is to Janet. Janet, the question is, uh, it's really amazing to hear about your career choice. 
did you get any resistance from parents or friends or your partner about choosing a career in sports? How did you overcome it? Sorry, yeah. So uh, luckily my parents and uh, my wife, you know, were really supportive. Um, I mean, I was, we've been together now 15 years. I mean, not married, but, you know, and she was there from the beginning of my career in sport. My parents also, my dad is in fact a sports nut. And that's why, you know, I kind of got the sports bug. And uh, luckily, you know, I didn't uh, face any res resistance. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, and friends, I mean, they sometimes look, I mean, and luckily, you know, it's been good till now, so. Good, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, okay, Aditya, uh, the question for you is, um, uh, love your work, ADK. Where does your inspiration come from? <laughs> uh, it's like a million dollar question. Uh, there's definitely no single um, uh, sort of source for, uh, for your inspiration. And it usually, it, it hits you completely out of the blue. Um, uh, but I think, I think you can always sort of help yourself get to that uh, sort of, um, uh, if, you, if you want to call it a sort of a happy sort of uh, coincidence of, of sort of, inspiration hitting you and and that's by uh, by you know continuing to sort of um, keep your mind occupied and, and it's mu music and and reading reading is definitely something that um, that is almost always given way to uh, to some sort of idea I mean it doesn't necessarily have to be the inspiration but it, it definitely leads you in the right direction um, so I think engaging with anything interesting, whether it's a book or whether it's a conversation with uh, uh, with someone, uh, I mean, actually visiting the art gallery and seeing other people's art is a fantastic way to to really stimulate uh, stimulate what you know what could be potentially your next uh, uh, next kind of ins inspiration. Um, I mean, they say you should steal. You really need to learn how to steal ideas as an artist and uh, not be worried about it uh, beyond the point. Of course, you have to make them your own. But uh, yeah, that's my two bits on, you know, on inspiration. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so my question now for Manisha. Uh, thanks for sharing your story, Manisha. Do you think the situation in India is changing a bit to create a more inclusive environment? What are some changes that you see? Um, I think uh, definitely the, the word inclusion has become a sort of a buzzword. So everybody's talking about it. Um, I think that's always a first step. Um, I think people are talking about being you know, companies are talking about being more inclusive. So I think just the vocabulary has changed. And I think that sort of um, gets people to even think about something that they never thought about before. So I think that's positive. On the school front, I think we're still pretty, have pretty far to go. We're, um, there really aren't that many schools that are willing to uh, be open to children with differences. And I feel like, um, I always hope that when people look at our example, they will, or other inclusive schools as well, they will sort of be uh, inspired to do, to know that, you know, it can be done and it's not impossible. Yeah, absolutely. I know personally, I was so happy to hear that BIS is, is being a front runner in this inclusivity effort. Um, okay, I will do one more round of questions before we move to our breakout rooms. So Sid, going back to you. Um, the question is great talk. I see resilience and perseverance as a common theme. Any suggestions to some methods, uh, meditation or sport or any of your personal methods that you've used to see yourself through difficult times? Oh, wow. Um... 
I, I think that's a very individual thing. Uh, for me personally, sure, meditation, workouts, etc., those kind of things help. But uh, the real thing, I think, is, you know, you go back, at least I do, I go back to the time when I started. And the reason I started and what is it that inspired me? Uh, was it a certain film? Was it a certain actor? Was it, uh, you know, my dad? So for me, it's been that. So when, when there have been dips in my career or when things haven't been working well for me or, you know, just life playing out and you're down and out. Uh, for me, it's been that. With work, it's always been, you know, why am I doing this? What is it that made me want to do this? Because um, for me personally, I, I gave up a lot. I gave up uh, a, a direction which, which showed, you know, more materialistic things, if you will. Uh, I gave that up uh, and that was a very conscious decision. So you go back to why, why am I doing this? Why did I start this? And I think uh, that's what sort of gets me back on track and, you know, keeps me motivated, inspired, etc. Thank you so much. That's a great answer. So my next question for Amit. Um, great presentation, Amit. What's the best way to connect with your team? How can property owner and part two of that question is how can property owners connect with Vista and understand Vista's business model? Oh, I think that's an easy question for me to answer. Uh, you can connect with me at amit.damani at stayvista.com. And I'll be happy to help you guys. Okay, and sorry, the first part of the question was, what's the best? Oh, sorry, maybe that was, okay. I thought they were asking you, what's the best way to connect to your own team? Never mind. Um, okay, um, Janet, the question for you is, it's amazing to hear, uh, no, what would be areas to focus on for a career in sports in the years to come? Additionally, how much of your interest in sport came from your years at the IS? So I'll answer the first part. Uh, I think uh, one area where we've seen a lot of growth uh, in the last couple of years has been esports. Um, it's growing exponentially, and you know I think that's one area you could focus on. Obviously, the you know sales, marketing, commercial side of sport is never going to change. But I think something you know looking forward, I think esports is going to be a huge uh, part of sport uh, going forward. Uh, the second part, BIS, I think, uh, you know, I'd written in my speech earlier, but I had to cut it short. But I think, you know, BIS was one of the first experience of uh, sports management, I think, was my time as sports secretary at BIS. And, you know, BIS always uh, allowed us to follow our passion and, you know, encouraged us to follow our passion. So I think, yes, I think BIS played a key role in, you know, shaping my career. You know, I, I probably didn't realize it those days, but, yeah, you know, organizing those tournaments and, you know, I mean, uh, uh, just a story from back in the day. I mean, we had a inter cricket tournament where normally the, you know, the team that wasn't playing, their, their, their people would be the umpires and was a new principal, Mr. Ghosh. So we said, you know, we'll, you know, get him to be the umpire because he loved cricket. And I mean, I thought it was a great move, but unfortunately it backfired because he gave me out. But yeah, I think BIS played a huge role in, you know, shaping my career. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I actually have a distinct memory of Sir Ghosh um, uh, letting us watch the FIFA World Cup, which was so great, the finals um, during school time. Um, okay, so my next question is for um, ADK. Thanks for sharing your story of how you made the leap from finance to art. Do you still keep finance as a backup career choice? Absolutely not. <laughs> that's a simple answer but um i mean I, I you know even though it wasn't for me i mean and, and that's something i it took took nearly a decade to figure out um i absolutely don't regret a minute of those nine plus years that i spent as a finance professional because there are innumerable things that i've learned uh, that i don't think any other career would allow you to pick up um, and, and I, so to, to answer the question, I, I don't see it as being my primary career choice. Um, but I have had the opportunity to sort of wear my finance hat, uh, during, uh, over the past um, 
four years, you know, you know, project here and there. And it's it, in those uh, few transactions where I made an impression on the client, they've sort of reached out, even knowing that I've become an artist and <laughs> they can, can you help me with a, you know, financial model or a, or a pitch document or just reaching out to someone. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed those short moments, instance of, you know, just kind of donning that hat again and getting just dabbling in finance. So uh, I, I, and plus in terms of, uh, you know, how my career, career progresses, I, I know that there are a lot of the skills that I learned um, um, as a finance professional will will come in handy because even though you know you're you're an individual you're not running a company as an artist uh, there are a lot of I mean you know touch wood should I become you know successful and, and you have to learn how to manage your career and uh, I think it'll come in in handy at the, in those moments uh, for sure. Yeah, I totally agree. I think finance is a skill that can never go uh -huh. to waste, probably. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, uh, Monisha, the last but not least, uh, it's great to hear that BIS was so encouraging. What's one thing that you wish the school or Mihan's classmates did differently? Um, uh, firstly, let me take that separately. Mihan's classmates, nothing. I think he was with them from lower prep, he was just one of them. Um, it was all seamless. I think sometimes the stars align and you get like a great bunch of kids, a great atmosphere in the school, a great bunch of parents behind those kids who are, you know, it, are answering some of those uncomfortable questions that some of them may have had about him initially. Um, so I think it was all, I really have to say that, uh, I don't say they should have done anything differently. Uh, as far as the school goes, I mean, inclusion is a process. Of course, things could be better. When Mihan joined school, there was just one, uh, the sort of special ed team, there was one counselor and one special educator. Now we have an entire team across the school. So it's an evolving process and everything's not going to be 100%, um, you know, all the time. And I think we just have to realize that it's a process and it will just keep getting better, you know, as we keep going along and doing it for longer. Yeah, thank you so much. I really hope to see that progressing. Okay, so that's the end of the panel portion. Like I said, we will move on to breakout rooms after that where all the attendees can have a more um, casual chat with the speakers. But before we do move on to the breakout rooms, I have some final thank yous that I wanna give. So first and foremost, thank you again to all of our speakers for sharing your stories. It's so inspiring to see what the BIS community is achieving in the world. I would also like to give a big thank you to my fellow alum, Ria Mehta. Ria was the lead curator of the TEDx Gateway events and has supported us immensely with these talks. We absolutely could not have done it without her. Thank you to Mrs. Anjali Karpe and Dr. Cyrus Vakil. We really appreciate the school's involvement and support in this alumni event. Also to the BIS IT and communication teams that have helped us with setup and promotion for this event. Thank you to the rest of the BIS alumni committee for working so hard to make this event a success. It's really so nice to see that the school spirit remains strong within us. Last but not least, thank you to all the attendees. We really hope you've enjoyed this evening and learned something new, and we hope to see you attending next year. Okay, now let's move on to our breakout rooms. Hopefully next year, you'll be able to chat with the speakers over, over Dave Samosas in the hall, but today you can have that casual chat in their breakout rooms. Each speaker has their own breakout room. Um, the instructions to enter a breakout room are on the screen for you to read. So essentially you click on the breakout rooms button at the bottom of your screen. It'll display the list of speakers and then you can choose the speakers whose room you want to join. Um, we encourage you to um, switch between rooms if you have questions or if you wanna have conversations with multiple speakers. Um, you don't need to come back to the main meeting room uh, at the end of the breakout rooms. You can just sign off if you're done. But I just wanna say a final thank you again and, uh, and yeah, hope to see you next year.